Yeah. Hello again, a welcome to the lecture course on relativity and cosmology. So we are in chapter nine devoted to classic tests of relativity. And uh, what we have done so far was the gravitational redshift, which is a very general effect following from the equivalence principle and effects um, relevant in um, astronomy and in the solar system, the gra gravitational deflection of light and also the perihelion motion of planets such as Mercury. Now in the remaining two sections, 9.6 and 9.7, I also described tests that were not strictly speaking classic in the sense that they were already um, tested very early, but they were calculated very early and they can be um, accommodated to the, to the, into the list of uh, classic tests. So 9.6, which is what we do today, is the geodetic precession. And 9.7 will be then the last one, which is um, a very exciting effect to the lens tearing effect. Now, what is a geodetic precession? Recall from our general discussion of differential geometry that if a vector is, par is parallelly transported around the closed curve, that in general it will not return into its initial direction. So if it starts here and there is curvature here in the region um, that the curve encircles, then you will have a precession depending on, on, the, on the curvature, on the Riemann tensor in fact. And um, this effect of course you can probe by a gyroscope uh, which defines a certain direction and you let it circle say around your earth and check um, whether the initial direction uh, or how the initial direction has changed and you compare this with the predictions of general relativity. In fact there is and I will, I will um, briefly discuss this at the end, um, an early calculation by De Sitter from the year 1916 already on this effect. This is why it's also called the De Sitter effect. And he did not, of course, have in mind um, a gyroscope circling around the Earth because space missions in 1916, I think no one, no one imagined uh, to have them. So at that time, of course, uh, Tilsita was thinking about ast astronom astronomical applications. And you have natural gyroscope, namely you have the Earth's moon orbit. Mm -hmm. So um, the Earth's moon orbit so, so if you if you have the Earth say in the center, and um, you um, have the the Moon circling around the Earth, and so this orbit defines a certain direction normal to it, and uh, this actually this precession uh, or, or this this um, vector processes around the normal to the ecliptic, which is the um, Pass of the Earth around the Sun in one year. No? So if you you have here the Earth's Moon system, of course goes in one year around the Sun, and uh, this direction um, defines a vector, and you have a precession because there's curvature inside, namely the the mass of the Sun. Hmm? Um, I will return to this at the end, uh, but let us immediately go to a more modern application, namely really have a gyroscope in a satellite. No, so we have um, here, so we consider uh, for simplicity, this is because uh, for, for the calculation, but of course calculations exist for general orbit, uh, for circular orbit, which is of course a geodesic, I mean it's a satellite in free fall that goes around the Earth, no? in free fall like the International Space Station, whatever, so they are geodesic motion. Uh, of a gyroscope in the, equ in the equatorial plane, which is um, theta equals constant, according to the convention around the mass m, or around a body with mass m. Um, so we have here um, the situations so of the mass, okay, spherically symmetric, uh, M and uh, later in the experiment this is the Earth and we have a circular orbit and uh, so we start having the direction of the 
gyroscope purely radially. So here, no? so gyroscope means um, you have um, a certain spinning object and this spinning object defines a direction. And if you're on flat space, this direction is always the same. I mean, if there's nothing outside, then it will keep its direction. Hmm? So you have this situation here, I mean, pictorially, and this gives you a vector S, a spin vector. Um, and this S is, we write as the absolute value times a unit vector. So this would keep its direction fixed in flat space time, but if you have this in curved space time and you orbit once, then it will not uh, return to its initial direction. So if this is the start, um, okay, it will, and this is what we calculate, point to a different direction, so start, end, and uh, say the motion here of the satellite is around this direction so you start radially without mass you it, it would just be on the same direction so it would come back here but uh, with the mass of course we have to calculate the effect also whether it's here or here then you have a precession it turns out that it will be a forward precession um, of course we have to calculate this um, this four-dimensional vector so this is a three-dimensional vector so we have to generalize this to a four-dimensional vector so we have a four-dimensional four-dimensional spin vector well it's a, we call it spin but it's not a quantum mechanical spin it's just a spin of a gyroscope spin vector as mu and um, we assume that in the local rest frame uh, in the absence of forces, we have the following equation, local rest frame. We have d over dt um, s of t equals zero. And uh, this s mu, it should return to having, I mean, in the rest frame, the component zero, and then the s vector. So should reduce to... Um, 0 s in the rest frame and so if we if we um, generalize this to four dimensional equation so um, we would or, or, or this this components to a covariant equation then we write s mu u mu is equal to zero so this is the four velocity, and it's clear if um, we are in the rest frame that this reduces to S0 equals zero. But otherwise, of course, you have some components because it must be covariant. Um, now, I mentioned that this is a circular orbit and it's a geodesic. So we have to use, um, or we can use the parallel transport um, of this, so the, the spin vector is parallel, parallelly transported, parallel transport. So we have um, d s mu over d s is equal to zero. And I recall this from uh, the chapter uh, five and the differential geometry that this is the absolute derivative, um, and it's, it vanishes for. Uh, um, parallel transport. Now, this you can write out in terms of um, ordinary derivatives and the Christoffel symbols. So we have d s mu over d s plus gamma mu nu lambda s nu u lambda equal to zero. No? And this four velocity in that particular case has only two components because the component the theta component um, vanishes because theta is constant and equal to pi over 2. And also the radial component vanishes because r is fixed. No? So u lambda, which is dx lambda over ds, is here, I mean dt over ds, 0, 0, and d phi over ds. No? Because this is the radial coordinate and, and r is constant and this is the theta coordinate and theta is also 
constant, so the four velocity has no components in these two directions. But of course, it has components in the t and the phi direction. So that's that. That's what we have to address. Um, I should mention that here in this section, I took much of the material from a book that I can recommend. Uh, and this is the book by Ciofolini and Wheeler called uh, Gravitation and Inertia from the 1990s. And uh, so they, in this book, they discuss effects and many other effects that have to do with um, processions and satellites and spins in, in great detail. You know? So um, I will not do all the algebraic steps in the calculation. You can fill them out easily yourself or you may wish to really um, sit down with that book and read the corresponding chapter. It's very nicely written and easily acceptable, uh, accessible in my opinion. Yeah, so that's what we have to uh, discuss in detail. Now, of course, um, the input is he, are here the Christoffel symbols. Now, the Christoffel symbols, of course, refer here to the spherically symmetric metric, which is the Schwarzschild metric. And where we will, we will uh, use Schwarzschild coordinates later. But first, uh, as, as we did before, uh, you already know that, we take the general ansatz of a spherically symmetric metric. So um, we have the, we take the form that the s squared is minus e to the nu of r, the t squared, plus e to the lambda of r, the r squared, plus r squared, and we have then the d theta squared, plus sine squared, theta d phi squared. Now you recall that, and uh, later we can choose particular expressions here um, using the standard form of the Schwarzschild metric. Uh, let us consider first the radial part of the um, spin, um, which is the component 1, no, 0, 1, 2, 3. So radial component, radial component of spin. So let me write it down here. So we have d s1 over ds plus gamma 1 nu 0 s nu u0 plus gamma 1 nu 3 s nu u3 is equal to 0. Now, so in the sum um, over the components of the four velocity, of course, only zero and three enter. Now, of course, we have to know the gammas. Um, I did not yet calculate them for you for that metric. Actually, we will do that in the next uh, chapter 10, when you learn differential geometric methods to easily uh, to find or to find easy access to calculation of such objects. So um, if you just wait uh, two weeks or one week, um, you will learn how to calculate them. Or you can do it yourself with coordinates, which is a bit lengthy. So I just rely on those expressions for the gamma here. So I do not calculate them here. And uh, so if you, if you look at the table of the gammas, you first find that this is gamma 1, 3, 3, S3, U3 because the remaining ones in the sum, no, you sum here over nu, are, are zero. No? So the remaining gamma 1, u3, they are zero. And here, similarly, not many of them are zero. So what remains is gamma 1, 0, 0, s0, u0, plus, I mean, from the sum, gamma 1. 1, 0, S1, U0. Hmm? So the remaining gamma 1, U0, they are 0. And um, of course, then there are the non zero ones, and you learn um, how to do the calculation quickly, as I mentioned. And uh, I just give you here the expression so it turns out that gamma 1, 0, 0 is new prime over. 2 e to the nu minus lambda. No, so the nu prime is a derivative with respect to r. Hmm? No, so maybe I should write that nu prime 
is d nu over dr. And also other primes uh, denote derivatives with respect to r. Then we have gamma 1, 1, 0 is uh, 1 half uh, d lambda over dt. Well, actually, I'm um, here in our case because the lambda depends only on r. This is also zero, but it's not uh, identical zero from the very beginning. It's just because here this is restricted to r. And then we have also the gamma 1, 3, 3 is minus r e to the minus lambda. Hmm? So if you like, you can try to calculate one of them just by using our expression from um, chapter 5, which, which, which is 1 half, and then g upstairs, and then the derivatives of the g. Now, so um, even without the new methods that you learn in chapter 10, you can use the old methods, the methods that Einstein used, uh, and, and just it's a matter of time um, to insert the expressions. Okay, so now um, having this inserted here and the explicit expressions here, then we can write down the uh, equation for S1. And let me do that here. So we have then the S1 over the S plus a new prime over 2 um, e to the new minus lambda S is 0 u0 zero, minus r e to the minus lambda S3 u3 is equal to 0. Now you see that's an equation that is not so uh, simple. Why? Because it's not an autonomous equation for the S1. Now we would like to have an equation for S1 only, which we could then integrate. But you see here, um, it's coupled, the, the various components are coupled. So we have here S0 and S3. So what can we do? How can we perhaps decouple the equation? And uh, we can do that by uh, further differentiation with respect to a, ds. So we differentiate this s, right? Then you have, of course, your second derivative. Um, but you also have here then the first derivative. And here you have the first derivative. And then you uh, insert here uh, the equations for s0 and s3. It's clear you have such equations, first derivatives for all components. And if you differentiate with respect to s, then you have here the first derivatives and you can insert this. So um, decoupling of the, com of the components, this is what results and what you can convince yourself. So we also take, of course, into account that r is constant. So there are no derivatives of r. No. So note also that r is constant. No, so we have dr over ds is 0. And we have also, then we have in particular no contributions from nu and lambda because they depend on r. So you see this assumption of having a, a, a circular orbit simplifies the uh, discussion. Otherwise, you have a very long and maybe also with the help of numerics calculation. No? So that, that is very important. Um, and uh, so we use also when we differentiate the four velocity, um, the geodesic equation. No? So use also the u mu over ds is minus gamma u mu lambda u nu u lambda. That's what, okay. And um, for example, here, this equation also, when you, when you write it down and when you insert the gammas that we had uh, earlier, then you find from this that the u0 over ds is zero and it's also valid for u3. Hmm? And that, that what you, I mean, you can just here set a zero, then you have here the zero and you use these expressions here and then you immediately find that uh, u0 and uh, u3, 
they are independent of S. Okay, and uh, this then leads to a decoupling of the equation. So from this here, we really find then the second derivative that we have d squared s1 over ds squared plus s1 and we have e to the minus lambda u3 squared minus u0 squared nu prime squared over 4 e to the nu minus lambda is equal to zero. Yeah, and you see, voila, very nice. This is an autonomous equation for S1. Yeah, so it's a second derivative of this. And here we have just linearly entering the S1 and the other components have been taken care of indirectly. Um, now this already looks a little bit like harmonic oscillator equation. Um, and in fact, it is because of that, uh, these are independent of the small s, and also this here is independent of the small s because r is equal to constant. Now, so this is really a constant, and we call it a frequency squared, no? because then we have really a harmonic oscillator equation. So we call this a capital omega squared. Now, don't be confused here by these indices, but this is how people write it. So this is the squared of an omega, and this is just a component. Um, but one has to live with that. No? And so we have finally then the equation d squared s1 over ds squared plus omega squared times s1 is equal to zero. No? So you see... Um, we were able to reduce this equation to really a harmonic oscillator equation. No? And then all the physicists are happy if they have reduced it because there we know all the solutions. And uh, let me write it down. So these are cosines and sines. And we need an initial condition, of course. And the initial condition is here that a spin points in the radial direction. So it has only a component... In, in small r. So we have here the initial condition is s mu of 0 is uh, 0, 1, 0, 0. Of course, this has a prefactor to make the dimensions correct, but we don't have to take care for that in solving the equation because uh, the prefactor does not play a role. You can add it at the end. You know? So you can just have a, have a dimensionless vector. Now this means it points in our direction, points in our direction. And you are free to uh, have this initial condition. And then it's clear that the solution of this is the cosine. And then we have here that S1 of S is the cosine of omega times S. No? Because then this solves the equation and also the initial condition, which is just... Uh, one here no, for the S1. And um, I can write down the omega explicitly, so which is uh, the square root of that, and I, I write it in the following form, putting the e to the lambda outside. Uh, so it gives e to the minus lambda over 2, and then we have a square root of u3 squared minus u0 squared times nu prime squared e to the nu over 4. Of course, this, this depends on the small r. That's clear, but r is constant. But of course, if the satellite is at different radius, then, of course, omega is different. Now, we have so far kept uh, nu and lambda general. Let us, in the following, now go to uh, standard Schwarzschild coordinates and... Um, write as follows. So we have a standard Schwarzschild coordinates. And uh, so I've seen them now many times. Um, you, know, you have here the 1 minus gm over r, and here you have the inverse of, of 1 minus 2 gm over r. 
So we have here e to the nu uh, is 1 minus 2 gm over r. So in particular the nu prime, which enters here, so the derivative with respect to r, and you can write this in the form 2 gm over r times r minus 2 gm. And uh, for the e to the lambda, then you have um, the inverse of that, which is uh, 1 minus 2 gm over r to the minus 1. And this is, of course, e to the minus nu. Hmm? So it's straightforward to insert this here into the omega. Of course, we are not quite uh, at the end, because we also uh, need, I mean, u3 and u0. I mean, this you insert here, and r is the fixed radius, and this is the mass, so that then you are done, but we need um, for the to finish the calculation u0 and u3. So this is what I do next. So we have this equation for S1 um, with the initial condition of pointing it in r direction, giving that solution, and the omega um, turn is given by this expression. Um, we insert here for lambda and nu the, the expressions written down earlier for the standard Schwarzschild coordinates, but we also have now to um, insert expressions for u0 and u3, and this is what I shall do next. So we need also, need also u3, which is uh, d phi over ds, if you recall and also u0, which is dt over ds, um, but which you can write as dt over d phi and d phi over ds. No? So um, you can relate this also to d phi over ds, but of course we have to know what, what this is. Let me recall the following. I mean, for this you have to remember the effective potential in the Schwarzschild metric. Ah, that for this situation looks like that. And we have a circular orbit. So we are here. No? So this here is the circular orbit. And in the exercises, you show that for these circular orbits, Kepler's third law, which you know from classical mechanics, is exactly valid in general relativity too. No? So, um, so for the act in the exercises, we have so Kepler, Kepler's uh, third law is valid for circular orbits. Well, otherwise, um, if you don't have a circular orbit, you have precession of ellipses, so you no longer have an ellipse where you could apply it. No. So, uh, but here it's valid, uh, in, and in the form that g times the mass is omega squ squared r cubed. Now the constant uh, radius of, this, of the circular orbit. And uh, this is the angle of frequency with respect to the coordinate time, t, not with, not with respect to the proper time. So that, that is what you can show and you have to use, so to speak, the uh, value here that you get from the effective potential. Yeah, so from this here, you have that phi is omega times t. Um, yeah, for the, the proof is uh, not so difficult. I mean, of course, uh, you have to calculate the minimum here you know, to that, and then you get from the expression that you, that you um, take from, from, from your notes. Um, you have this, uh, the angular momentum, and it gives you the relation between the phi and the proper time and the r. And also, from, I mean, this is the same exercise as you also get from the Schwarzschild line element the relation between the proper time and the coordinate time, which is, um, I mean, the d tau squared. When I write d tau squared, is minus the s squared. And uh, you get here 1 minus 3m or 3gm over r dt squared. Hmm. 
No, that I mean, you just write. I mean, you have r equals constant and theta equals constant, and then you have uh, from the d tau squared just two terms: the one with the d t squared and the one with the d phi squared. And then you, from from this condition, you relate. You can relate the, the phi with the tau, and then solve respect to the tau, and then you get okay the one minus two g m over r from the time, and then you get uh, an additional g m over r from that phi of tau. Yeah. No, so you can use here Kepler's third law. So if you insert then here, I mean this here is omega to the minus one then, and you calculate this from uh, from here, from Kepler's third law, then you get that omega. If I insert everything, so here the expressions for the Schwarzschild metric and here the results. I mean. This I just insert here, and um, and the u zero squared gives a d phi over the s squared, which together with this I can then put outside the square uh, root, and this I calculate here from Kepler's third law. No? I mean, omega squared is g m over r cube. This is what what I insert here then for the omega to the minus one. So I finally, if you do that, I get d phi over d s. The square root of 1 minus 3 gm over r. And uh, in fact, here from, from this equation, you get it, you see that this is directly here, I um, mean, the small omega. Now, the small omega, which is d phi over dt, and it's d phi over ds times ds over dt, or d tau over dt, and this is what you get from here. No, so, in fact, this capital omega here for the circular orbit, of course, is equal to that small omega that enters Kepler's third law. That's an interesting result. Um, now, we have solved completely the uh, equation for the component S1 or SR for the radial component of the spin. Similar things you can do for the other component. No, I will not do that in um, detail, so other components. No, so, of course, we have to say S3. So you write down the geodesic equation for S3, which turns out to be the following, ds3 over ds plus uh, 1 over r S, S1 u3 equal to 0. Um, but so you don't have to now differentiate this again and have a separate um, autonomous equation for S3 because we have found the solution for S1. No? So you, so that that uh, so so we insert here that this is um, the cosine of omega times s. Hmm? And for this here, of course, we already have here the d phi over d s. So which we, which we can relate to capital omega by this equation, no? to, to d phi over d s. So this is um, um, u3, which is here, is omega, capital omega over, over this constant square root. And so from this, you can convince yourself that s3 is a minus 1 over square root of r squared minus 3 gmr times the sine omega s. Hmm. Now, but still you have here the cosine and you integrate and this gives them the sine. No? So for the initial condition that s3 of 0 is 0 because you have a purely radial um, initial direction. Okay, now let us uh, look in more detail what this means for the precession. Um, if we move once around the circular orbit, you know, so, so one motion in this direction, initial place and the final place, and uh, one motion of course corresponds to, uh, one, one circle corresponds to delta phi is 2 pi. Then, I mean, in the azimuth angle, you just have 360 degrees. So, one motion 
along the circular orbit. Now you have delta phi is 2 pi. So you have to calculate, I mean, here in the argument of um, the cosine, of course, you have the capital omega and you have to this proper time. So um, you, you have to calculate what happens with this expression when you have the phi a difference in 2 pi. No? So having a delta phi of a 2 pi. Um, and so you get from this, then from this result, that you can write it as a delta, because it's uniform, delta phi over delta s, and you have 1 minus 3 gm over r times delta s. Now that's, uh, I mean, if you multiply with s and use the uniform motion, that's what you get. Evaluated at delta phi is 2 pi. Um, so that's um, then 2 pi times that square root. Now, and you see here, this is no longer 2 pi. So this is smaller than 2 pi hmm? because of that uh, factor that depends on the mass. Hmm? In, in flat space, of course, it would just be 2 pi. But when you here have a, a difference in the angle of 2 pi, I mean, the argument of that is different from 2 pi. If you say have here, if you write down the sine, sine of a, a omega s, of course this corresponds to the component here of, of the s3. Then um, you have here the sine, of course, <laughs> and omega times s. And here we have the 2 pi. And here we are a, a little bit, well, it's a small effect, so we are here somewhere here. So that's then the sign, yeah, the actual value that we have here for that component. And so after one orbit, uh, so we have for the um, phi component, then, um, okay, it's written down here, minus one over square root of r cubed minus three gmr times the sign omega s. And this is here negative, as you see. And uh, so this is positive. So the, the phi component is positive. Um, this means that the phi component has not yet reached its initial value, which is zero. Now initially, the s was uh, zero, one, zero, zero. So the initial value for the phi component was zero because it pointed in purely radial direction. Now, without the mass, it would be again zero, right? But here you see it's a, it's a positive and it goes down from positive to zero. So it has not yet reached its initial value. So has not yet reached, has not yet reached uh, its initial value, you know, which is uh, S3 of zero equals zero. Um, so it has remained behind a little bit. So um, the picture is that if you have here again the, the mass m and the orbit, circular orbit. And uh, so we have here the initial direction. No? So initial direction. Then without the mass, it, you would have like that, and it would go back here. But here uh, we have, uh, here it's, it's a little bit positive. So it has here, so that that's what you get then after. And to, to reach the initial direction, it would have to, to move a little bit forward. Yeah. So, okay, so this is what we have here now, in a sense, after one, uh, motion. It, it points into this direction. So, but this corresponds, I mean, if you just view the difference to the flat space case, it, it corresponds to a precession in this direction. Yeah. And that precession forward. So you have a precession uh, in the forward direction. So in the direction of motion. No? 
direction of motion of, of the satellite. And this is what we call the geodetic precession because it's on a geodesic. So this is the geodetic precession. You can, of course, relate this to a precession frequency. I mean, different from these omegas, which we call omega g, um, and calculate, I mean, the, the size of this precession. Uh, so precession, and this means with uh, angular, angular velocity omega g, and uh, this can be defined by, by, I mean, the difference that uh, omega s has from 2 pi at um, delta phi is uh, 2 pi, and we define this to be 2 pi over the small omega times the, times this precession omega g. You know? Okay, this is the t the period, and if you in, uh, insert here the omega s, um, which we have here calculated, Oh, it's here, that expression. You find that um, this is 2 pi times 1 minus square root of 1 minus 3 gm over r. Hmm? Okay, this is a very small quantity uh, here if you I mean, are around the Earth, say, or any other object in the solar system. So you can expand the square root, and uh, this, this gives 3 pi gm over r. So from this, I mean, you have to divide by, by this factor, you get then that omega g is uh, omega times 1 minus square root of 1 minus 3 gm over r, which is of approximately omega times uh, 3 gm over 2r. And the small omega you can again replace from Kepler's third law, which is written down here. So um, this here is um, square root of gm over r cube. So that if I insert now all the constants, even the speed of light, so we have then omega g at least in this limit is then roughly speed of light times square root of uh, gm over c squared r cube times 3 gm over 2r c squared. Now, so that's the final result that you have for the geodetic precession in, um, around the spherical symmetric mass on a circular orbit. And of course, you can do the calculation for any orbit. It just becomes much, much, much more complicated uh, for the algebra, but not from the principal point of view. It's the same type of calculation. Um, I mentioned at the beginning this uh, nice book by uh, Truffolini and uh, Wheeler, and they have much more information on that. So they find, uh, or they give here the, gen the following general um, expression for the geodesic precession for general motion. So, general motion, so see, for example, the book by Ciuffolini and Wheeler, and so they write it in the following form, so ds over ds, I mean the change with proper time of the spin 3 vector, and of course uh, this is the general definition of the precession from mechanics, omega g times s, and they, they give the following expression for omega g minus 3 half v cross um, nabla phi, and this is the gravitational potential, so if you approximately set this to the Newtonian value, which you can do here then you have 3 minus 3 gm over 2 r squared. Then we have v cos r 
No? So then you see this is orthogonal to the orbital plane, no? because I mean this is the radial vector and this is the motion and then this um, cross product is orthogonal to that. So we have this is orthogonal to orbital plane. Uh, you, you can see that for the circular motion that we can recover our results. So circular motion, no? so we have then V is orthogonal to R, no? if you are on a circle, and then you get that the absolute value of this is um, then 3GM over 2R squared, absolute value of uh, V, which is just omega times r, with respect to r to infinity, which is then given by um, square root of gm over r cube times 3 gm over 2r. No? And this is what we had before uh, in our, as a result here, no? as above. So if you just look up, what they what they what they what they find here, then you can specialize and find our result that we did explicitly. Um, if I should note finally here that if S is uh, orthogonal to the orbital plane, then um, we have no effect. Yeah, because um, then um, this is parallel. These two are parallel, right? If this is um, um, orthogonal to the orbital plane and then we have no precession and all other cases the S precesses around the omega G. Now um, come back to what I said at the beginning, the sitter, Willem de Sitter in 1916 calculated this effect already, I mean very soon after Einstein wrote down his final equation, so it was very quick, um, for the Earth-Moon system and uh, found then the effect that is normal to the Earth-Moon orbit processes around the normal to the ecliptic. Hmm? No? So example, Earth-Moon system, Earth-Moon system uh, can be considered as a gyroscope. No? So this is uh, this is 1916. Um, with its axis perpendicular to the orbital plane and it processes, processes around the normal to the ecliptic. So with its axis perpendicular to the orbital plane. So in this processes, you have, or you have a precession um, around the normal to the ecliptic, the ecliptic, and yeah, you have to insert the numbers. I mean here, um, then the mass of the sun, of course, and all these constants, and uh, here one astronomical unit, and uh, so with um, omega g, approximately zero point zero one nine two arc seconds per year, which is 19.2 uh, 19 milli arc seconds per year. So it's about two arc seconds per century. Yeah. So that's again a very small effect. Remember the perihelion motion of Mercury was 33 arc seconds per century. So that's of the same order. Um, I mean, with respect to what, I should say, of course, to far away stars, but um, with more precisely with respect to reference system that is defined by far away, by remote quasars. Um, and this was measured, but not in the Sitter's days, to my knowledge, um, but in more recent years. So I have here one reference measured with um, 0 0.7. Um, percent accuracy by D.K. et al. in 1996. Now by the exact measurement of the Earth's moon distance with laser, lunar laser ranging. Now the Apollo astronauts have put 
equipment there so that you can send lasers that are reflected by there and so you can very precisely measure the Earth's moon distance. And, um, and from that, I mean, this enters, of course, as a parameter here and uh, so um, you can measure this effect very precisely. Um, now, this is called the sitter effect in this, com in this um, context. No, the geodetic precession is called the sitter effect if you apply it to, to the Earth-Moon system. But of course, uh, in, of interest is also direct measurement. And um, there is a famous satellite mission called Gravity Pro B that will play a very uh, important role in the next section. So, okay, so this is the uh, first example. And the second is um, the Gravity Pro B. No, so this was launched in uh, 2004 and the uh, end of the mission was about one year later in 2005. This was on a, on a polar orbit in a height of 642 kilometers polar orbit and the effect predicted, so that I, I just write this here, effect predicted from um, general relativity for that orbit was uh, is minus 6,606.1 mini arc seconds per year. Of course, the minus is then the convention that it goes in this direction. Um, and observed was minus 6,600. Uh, yeah, minus 6,601.8 plus or minus. 18.3 milli arc seconds per year uh, in by average at all in the year 2011. You know? So um, that satellite was designed mainly for the effect we discuss in the next section, the Lenzatiri effect, but of course it also uh, measured other things and also measured this um, geodetic precession. And you see that the um, agreement with the theory is uh, excellent. So this and the independent the sitter effect uh, should convince you of the reality really of that effect that vectors parallel transported in curved space time experience a precession. Um, I should finally mention that if the motion is non-geodesic, which it could be, uh, if you have a, uh, a rocket with a machine or whatever, then it's an additional contribution. Um, and this additional contribution comes from the general relativistic version of what is called a Thomas precession. The Thomas precession, perhaps you know from special relativity, and it um, has the origin, the origin is a non commutativity of, of Lorentz transformations if they are not in the same direction. If you have, if you remember special relativity, if you have a, a boost here and a boost here, you can replace it by a boost in the same direction. But if you have a boost here and say a boost here, you cannot replace it by one boost. You have to have precession in addition. And this is called the Thomas precession. And um, in, rel in, in, in general relativity, you also have, have um, this. So it uh, also of the form um, V cross A, so the velocity is three velocity cross the three acceleration. Um, all of this has been discussed and calculated in literature and uh, although we do not need it here, so for those of you who are very much interested in this uh, type of effects, I can again draw your attention to this book or maybe some other, other sources, but this book explains it very nicely. So you can use it, of course, again, as a test of relativity by including this parameter gamma uh, and generalize the, the Schwarzschild metric. But everything is in agreement with, with the Schwarzschild metric and with general relativity. So no, there's no longer doubt that GR is incorrect at that scale. So these effects and are, are used now, as always, as probes to determine parameters, masses and the like. Okay, so far for today, so there's one 
section left, which is the lensatiering effect and which is an exciting effect because it brings into the game the uh, rotation of the mass and uh, in if, if say you have the satellite, this satellite here around the Earth, where the Earth is rotating and it tracks along empty space time with it. And because the, a, a gyroscope feels the inertia of empty space time, you have an additional precession coming from that effect. And this is um, why this mission was actually planned and carried through. So uh, next time I calculate for you that effect and I will tell you what this um, satellite measured. So until next time, bye bye.